So I've just put the Twitter hashtag into the chat so that you should have yeah. that. Yeah. So, um, okay, are you ready, Imogen? Lovely. Well, sure it's an absolute pleasure to introduce Imogen Bell from the Centre of Youth Mental Health at the University of Melbourne. Thanks so much, Sarah. Try and um, just need to enable screen sharing by the host. Better. Can you let me know, Sarah, when you can see my screen? That's perfect, Imogen. Thank you. I think you're ready to go. Fantastic. Okay. Um, first of all, I just want to um, thank Warren and, and the organising team for setting up this fantastic conference. It, I know how much effort goes into these things and to make it free and accessible to, to everybody um, and to, to bring everybody together internationally is, you know, such a huge thing to do. So thank, thank you so much. I think that I speak for everybody in saying that we're really grateful for the efforts that you've um, you've put in, and I'm really excited to be able to share the findings of this uh, work that I've been doing um, with the team that's listed below. So this is actually part of the Welcome Trust um, Active Ingredients Project, which some of you may have heard of. A lot of the active ingredients that are being looked at are transdiagnostic um, processes. So. This is a report we actually did last year for the active ingredients projects in 2020. Um, and we're currently in the process of updating it to a meta-analysis, which has taken longer than I expected. So I'm gonna give you a bit of a snapshot of what some of the meta-analysis findings are, um, but mostly focus on what we produced within this um, report, which is focusing on the transdiagnostic process of repetitive negative thinking. So to give you some context on this active ingredients project, I think it's important to highlight in the context of this conference, because I think that this initiative by Welcome is probably one of the most significant things to advance this field um, that's come along, you know, possibly ever, and their investment in, in it is, is humongous. So really the, the, the justification for focusing on this project is that, you know, mental health remains one of the biggest problems of our time, um, particularly for young people where these illnesses tend to emerge. And we still don't really understand how best to treat uh, mental illness and that treatments aren't advancing. I think many people will relate to the idea that, you know, we're, we're kind of stagnating and not moving fast enough when it comes to advancing treatments relative to uh, physical health, for example. So Welcome believes that in order to advance treatments and identify the next generation, um, we need to understand what the actual active ingredients are that underpin those interventions. And they define active ingredients as aspects of interventions that make a difference in preventing, treating uh, and managing anxiety and depression in particular. Right. Um, and they've got some great um, communication tools. They've got, they, they talk about this idea of ingredients, you know, what it, maybe the, the illness itself or the intervention itself is, is, you know, the cake, but the individual ingredients like the, you know, the eggs and the flour, the things that go into it kind of contribute to um, form this effect. So they see active ingredients as spanning uh, biological, cognitive and relational and societal approaches. So, so far, they've, over the last two years, they've funded 51 different teams across the world to look at different active ingredients. And the one that we looked at was repetitive negative thinking. So what is repetitive negative thinking? My understanding is that there's been other talks about this at the conference and many of you might be familiar. So I will breeze through this in favor of getting to the, the juice of the talk. But um, I think this, this quote here really captures from the perspective of young people, what it's like to experience repetitive negative thinking. And this image certainly captures it well. So one of the young people we spoke to in this in this report um, described it like a cycle you, of getting stuck. Uh, you feel stupid for getting stuck and then you feel stupid for feeling stupid. Then you feel pathetic, helpless, and suddenly you're tangled in this um, experience of, of negative thoughts taking over your thinking. Um, from an academic perspective, these are two really seminal um, uh, publications, but the formal definition of, of repetitive negative thinking or RNT 
is a thinking process that's, that's repetitive, so it recurs. It's um, passive and or relatively uncontrollable, so it can kind of happen without people being aware and they can't stop it from happening when it does. And it's focusing on, on negative content. So one of the things that comes up a lot is that um, repetitive negative thinking seems to have a strong relationship with rumination and worry, and there's certainly a lot of crossover between the two constructs. Um, and rumination has traditionally been looked at in relation to depression and, and worry in relation to anxiety. But in fact, when you have a look at um, research that examines them together, it seems as though there's a lot of overlap in predicting uh, different psychopathological outcomes. And it's rather repetitive negative thinking as the broader construct. So it doesn't so much matter what it is you're worrying or ruminating about. It's the fact that you're getting hooked on negative content of any kind, which seems to drive those outcomes um, uh, in a more powerful way. So RNT is correlated with anxiety and depression in young people. It's a predictor of anxiety and depressive disorders, actually other disorders as well, OCD, um, other, other sorts of conditions. RNT predicts the onset of emotional disorders in longitudinal studies. So we start to see a clear image of its uh, causal relationship with these constructs as well. And when you experimentally induce repetitive negative thinking, it results in a worsening of affective states. So really there's quite a consistent literature that has shown that repetitive negative thinking really is one of the primary transdiagnostic mechanisms that uh, seems to be driving depression and anxiety in particular. So this leads us to think, well, okay, if, if repetitive negative thinking is one of the drivers underneath the hood, of depression and anxiety, then perhaps reducing repetitive negative thinking may have a flow on effects for improving depression and anxiety outcomes um, in young people, but also there is literature showing this in adults as well. So on the basis of that justification, the real question that we wanted to know was, okay, well, if repetitive, you can hear my Twitter go off, um, if repetitive negative thinking is an important uh, driver of depression and anxiety, then what sorts of psychological treatments are most effective in reducing it? And what are the active ingredients of these, of these psychological treatments? So we wanted to know um, what is the effect of different psychological treatments on depression, anxiety, and repetitive negative thinking outcomes and what's the relationship between these outcomes um, you know if repetitive negative thinking is driving improvements if reducing repetitive negative thinking is driving improvements then we should see relationships between those outcomes so as repetitive negative thinking reduces we should also see a reduction in depression anxiety um, are there different effects between psychological treatments and uh, subgroups and really you know according to the transdiagnostic theory uh, and underpinning this argument is that you know, if you target reducing repetitive negative thinking specifically, then you should see, uh, um, and that that's an important active ingredient in these treatments, then you should see better effects in treatments that do that relative vote to those that are kind of more general. We also wanted to see what the perspectives were of young people with lived experience and clinicians uh, regarding treatments for RNT. You know, do they think it's important? So we conducted a systematic review of randomized control trials and we, we are in putting the finishing touches on the, the meta-analysis at the moment. And we did some focus groups as well with, with young people and also clinicians. So here's what we found. Um, we've updated this now. I think that there's more like 29 randomized controlled trials, but of 16 different treatments. So lots of different treatments out there that included um, an outcome of repetitive negative thinking, depression and anxiety, um, all within the one trial, um, covering over 2,200 young people. We also spoke to a handful of clinicians and, and young people as well. So quite a, a good amount of literature out there, but uh, a lot of different treatments. So these are all the different treatments that, that we found. Quite a lot of them were focused on repetitive negative thinking, but also quite a lot that weren't. I have a look at that. Just to talk briefly about what these, um, what, what the techniques actually looked like. Um, when we think about active ingredients, we're thinking about what it is that is actually going on within the intervention itself that might be making a difference. 
um, on outcomes like RNT and depression and anxiety. So some of the uh, interventions focus on modifying thought content. So using CBT strategies like cognitive restructuring. Other ones address problematic beliefs about repetitive negative thinking. So this is where we see metacognitive therapies trying to address, you know, thoughts about um, not having any control over worry, for example. Reducing attention or attachment to negative thoughts through mindfulness and acceptance based strategies. So not getting so uh, hooked into the cycle of them. Increased exposure to sources of worry and rumination so that they kind of uh, people are less sensitive to reacting to them in a um, uh, with RNT. Developing better emotion regulation strategies. So actually dealing with the emotions that are underpinning um, the, the, the thoughts that young people are getting stuck on. Correcting biases in attention and interpretation. So there is some literature suggesting that people with um, depression and anxiety tend to have a bias towards, um, you know, in interpreting things in a negative way and that that causes them to get hooked on them um, and they kind of discount any sort of positive. So correcting that attention bias is one of the, the really common techniques. Making thinking um, more concrete and less abstract and sort of generalized and correcting behaviors that maintain repetitive negative thinking. So this is a big one in RNT focused CBT, you know, having a look at the, the behaviors that are actually um, maintaining repetitive negative thinking and replacing those with more adaptive behaviors. So this is some of the preliminary snapshots that came out of the report and, and um, this will be updated in the published meta-analysis which will come out um, hopefully soon. Um, but we are seeing um, some consistencies, but I will I will say to you that um, you know this is fairly preliminary. Um, so, um, depression, anxiety, and repetitive negative thinking outcomes are related. So, when we run the meta regression, we do get um, a, a relationship between them. So, um, you can see here that the effect sizes are all in the moderate range, and they're quite similar between you know across all of the treatments in terms of improving depression, anxiety, and repetitive negative thinking outcomes. What we don't know from the meta regression, obviously, is whether or not reducing repetitive negative thinking is what's causing improvements in depression, anxiety outcomes. So we know that they're related, but we don't know the causal uh, nature of that relationship. Um, when we look at, at subgroups, we also were interested in comparing RNT focused and non RNT focused treatments. We're also very interested in looking at treatments that um, compared whether or not they were focusing on changing the content of what people were worrying or ruminating about versus, um, versus uh, interventions that were targeting the process of getting hooked onto a negative thought in, in any way. And the reason for that is that there is a broader implication within the literature that argues, well, you need to have the treatment that focuses on worry or rumination because people are worrying and ruminating about different things. So you need to change what they're worrying about in order to see the, improve, uh, the improvement. Other, another uh, argument in the literature is that it doesn't matter what the person's worrying, worrying about. So rather getting them to detach from negative thoughts of any kind is, is much more important. So we were interested in seeing whether there was a differential effect there. Some other subgroups about how the intervention was delivered, how many sessions there were and some of the sample characteristics. We saw very similar effects for um, RNT versus non-RNT focused intervention. So this really challenges the idea that targeting repetitive negative thinking specifically will lead to better effects because it's just not what we saw. And when we, this is consistent with what we're finding in the meta-analysis, comparing those groups doesn't seem to make a difference. However, for re reducing repetitive negative thinking specifically, it seems like there's larger effects for um, interventions that, that try and achieve that as the primary focus. Interestingly, um, and this does seem to be coming out in the meta-analysis too, is that when you target the process of thinking through mindfulness, acceptance-based strategies, there seems to be larger effects than if you try and change the content of what the person is worrying or ruminating about, which I think is, is quite significant theoretical implications about that too. Um, treatments delivered in groups or by clinicians might yield better results, um, but that digital treatments um, might be similarly effective for anxiety and RNT outcomes. The dosage effect didn't, didn't kind of play out, so even brief interventions worked. Um, there were some interesting findings about treatment timing too from a couple of the studies, which I can talk about um, in a bit more detail if anybody wants me to. 
And really, one of the things that Welcome really wants to know is what works best for whom and the designs of the studies at the moment are just not able to tell us much about that. The focus groups we ran with young people really mirrored um, these findings and isn't it? everybody agreed that repetitive negative thinking was a problem and that it was important to target um, this in treatment. But how to go about doing that really was mixed and it, it depended on things like what stage of illness, how old the young person was, how aware they were of this tendency to get stuck in their thoughts and also the kind of nature of, of the thoughts was important too. There was a real emphasis on, on empowering young people to make choices to combat the help, the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that tended to come along with the experience of RNT. Just briefly, if we have a look at these findings in relation to what we see in adult literature, there have been two meta-analyses on this and they, they are consistent. So I think this um, quote from uh, the Spinhoven article really captures this. The results do not support the notion that treatments specifically focusing on RNT are superior um, relative to traditional treatments. So we see similar moderate improvements across all of the outcomes, regardless of the treatment type, but that repetitive negative thinking, depression and anxiety outcomes appear to be strongly related to, some, uh, to one another. And the reason for this is, is probably because there's so much crossover between all of the interventions. They're all equally effective because they're all doing similar things. Uh, and the, the studies that we have are not well, they haven't deconstructed the mechanisms that are going on within these individual interventions um, as well as we need to in order to advance things. But the key insights here are that re reducing uh, RNT is important. Um, we need more of those types of studies that can actually um, look at whether reducing RNT is the driver for improvement in outcomes. Um, you, can, you can improve RNT using a variety of strategies and we need better scientific approaches to deconstruct what works best and also for whom. Um, our process focused interventions seem to be more effective. There's a lot of um, a lot more work to be done there. And the best treat, uh, vehicle of treatment delivery is not, not the most necessarily the most complex or expensive one. And we should be looking at, at what works for whom, but also when. Some recommendations here from um, clinicians and young people. So assessing and treating repetitive negative thinking is important and that a wide variety of treatments will probably work. Consider the treatment timing and how it's delivered and really empower young people to be involved in the choices that they have about how to go about doing that. And that for research and policy, we need more work to try and compare different treatment components, try and deconstruct what's actually going on within these interventions. And I think in particular, ideographic methods are um, going to be very important, important there. And on that note, I think I do have a minute to, to talk to you about a, a work that's arising from this on a mobile app that we're uh, developing called Mellow. This is a, an, an ecological momentary intervention. So it's designed to help young people in the moment with stuck thinking. Uh, and basically what happens is that they're prompted to complete a, a very brief questionnaire, which asks them how stuck they are in their thoughts, um, which then tailors an intervent a suggestion for an intervention strategy that might work for them to get unhooked from repetitive negative thinking in that moment. After they've completed that intervention, they're asked again how uh, stuck in their thoughts they are, um, which and this all can feed into another area of the app, which gives them insights into kind of what works from and when, and also the relationship between their stuck thinking and some contextual variables. So that's really exciting. We're doing a, um, a, a clinical trial and that's starting very, very soon. But I wanted to kind of highlight something about the scientific, um, what this really offers in terms of our scientific understanding of repetitive negative thinking and arising from what I mentioned before. So because we're measuring stuck thinking before and after um, each intervention strategy and each, in, there's, there's uh, a number of different intervention strategies that young people engage in. And that's because we know that um, that's because we know that a number of different things work and it's going to depend on the person. So there's a really interesting research question, I think, that we can answer here by comparing um, changes in stuck thinking before and after engaging in different types of intervention strategies. So we can compare uh, intervention strategies that target the process versus, versus intervention strategies that target the content um, over time. So there's a real opportunity here, I think, to, to deconstruct what works for whom um, and when. 
If you want to learn any more about this, there's lots of resources on the, the Welcome Trust page and also in uh, the Mental Elf, wonderful Mental Elf uh, resources there, there too. And that is it from me. Wonderful. Thank you, Imogen. I'm going to ask everyone to unmute to uh, join me in a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think we've got one minute spare if anyone has the question. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed that. Uh, Kuba. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. I just wanted to ask about um, the potential benefits of rumination and, and negative thinking styles, because I guess we know that in order to resolve any problems in life, we need to focus on negative content as well. And I was just wondering if there's a chance that maybe removing rumination might reduce distress to some degree, but not necessarily in the long term. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, there is a difference in the in the definition of, of repetitive negative thinking um, between productive and unproductive kind of forms of it. So this idea of there being a reflective form of rumination in particular, where you're reflecting on the things in your life that you're not happy with in, in order to, you know, um, address those. So there certainly is a function, um, a positive function to repetitive negative thinking that allows the person to say solve problems that they're facing or address issues within their life. Um, but the, the unproductive form is primarily, um, is primarily becomes a thinking habit. So rather than being directed at solving a problem or functioning in some way in order to progress the person, um, they get stuck kind of cycling around and around and around and around and around and it, the, the issue and they don't tend to um, get anywhere. So there is, is a difference and some scales kind of um, differentiate between that and, and others um, not so much, but certainly there has been, um, yeah, some discussion in the literature about those two different forms. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Imogen. There were so many sort of nuggets there in that talk of things that would be really good to think about in more detail. Um, so maybe later in the discussion time, we can come back to some of those. But um, to keep us on schedule, it's time. Yeah, wonderful slides are up. Thank you, Amy. So it's a pleasure to introduce Amy Jubert from the Clinical Research Unit for Anxiety and Depression at St. Vincent's Hospital in Sydney. Is that coming up all right for everyone? Yes. Your, your volume's a little bit low for me. I don't know if anyone else can hear you. Is that a bit better? That is absolutely spot on now. Thank you. Amy. Okay, wonderful. Hi, everyone. And thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. Um, today, I'll be presenting on an online intervention that we developed to target repetitive negative thinking. And um, as you mentioned there, this research is a joint collaboration between the Clinical Research Unit for Anxiety and Depression at St Vincent's Hospital and the University of New South Wales, both of which are in Sydney. Um, some of the intro bit might overlap a little bit with Imogen, so we're getting a bit of um, repetition there there, bear with me. Um, but repetitive negative thinking is defined as repeated dwelling on negative feelings, situations and events. It's experienced by individuals as intrusive, uncontrollable and repetitive. And it's been well established as a transdiagnostic process with elevated levels of RT found in a number of clinical disorders. Um, the scope of my research and today's presentation, however, has been limited to RT in many major depression and generalized anxiety disorder. Oh, let me see whether I can go to the next slide. Okay, so arguably two of the most studied variants of RNT are rumination and worry. So rumination involves thinking over and over about past negative experiences, dwelling on failures, regrets, perceived negative aspects of the self, and also overanalyzing current mood. While worry involves thinking over and over about future risks and uncertainties and how one would cope if these did occur. 
Um, so rumination and worry, um, as Imogen mentioned, have been shown to be highly correlated, sharing more similarities than differences. They're transdiagnostic processes with both rumination and worry associated with symptoms of anxiety and depression, and they often co-occur in the same individual. So individuals who worry tend to also ruminate and vice versa. And both processes have also repeatedly been implicated in the onset duration and severity of both depression and anxiety disorders. And they've also been shown to increase the risk of relapse following treatment, so making them important treatment targets. Um, and as Imogen went through, there's a number of CBT-based treatments that have been developed to specifically target RNT, such as rumination-focused CBT and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And these have been shown to be effective in reducing participants self-reported levels of rumination and depressive symptoms. Um, relevant to my research, there's also been promising initial findings when interventions specifically targeting both rumination and worry are delivered via the internet. So for example, in 2017, Topper and colleagues randomly allocated adolescents who were experiencing high levels of RNT to receive rumination-focused CBT to, delivered in either a face-to-face -face group format or via the internet with clinician support. And they compared this to a waitlist control group. And they found that both the group and internet delivered rumination-focused CBT significantly reduced participants' levels of rumination and worry, as well as symptoms of depression and anxiety compared to that waitlist control group. Similarly, Cook and colleagues in 2019 found that guided internet delivered rumination focused CBT was significantly more effective at reducing rumination and worry um, and depression compared to treatment as usual. And that was in university students with elevated levels of RNT. And the findings of these two studies also demonstrated that the internet can be an effective mode of delivery for interventions targeting rumination and worry. And this is important as there's a number of um, delivering treatment online helps to overcome a number of the well-established barriers to accessing face-to-face -face psychological treatment, such as costs, the availability of trained clinicians, long waiting lists, patient's geographical location, and as we've all seen over the last 18 months or so, global pandemics. Um, Okay, so I've very quickly gone through and shown you that rumination and worry can be targeted and reduced and that doing so is associated with improvements in both depression and anxiety symptoms. We've also seen that the internet can be an effective mode of delivery for these targeted interventions. And these initial findings are really encouraging. However, the limited research to date has only been carried out in adolescent and young adult populations. And to our knowledge, no studies looked at the impact of an internet delivered intervention targeting both rumination and worry in adults. The Two previous studies have also focused on the prevention of anxiety and depression. So treatment effects in people currently experiencing depression and anxiety is unknown. Um, these existing internet delivered RNT interventions have also been delivered with clinician support. And this significantly reduces the scalability and cost effectiveness of delivering treatment online. So we also wanted to investigate treatment effects when an intervention is delivered in a self-help format. Um, and when compared to self-guided online programs, clinician-guided programs have typically been associated with superior clinical outcomes and adherence. But more recently, we're seeing some of the self-guided online programs, which include features to sort of increase um, user adherence and engagement, like automated email reminders and prompts. They've shown similar rates of adherence and improvement to those clinician-guided interventions. So to help us um, or to help inform decisions about how best to disseminate the intervention to the general public, we also wanted to compare treatment effects and adherence when the intervention was delivered with and without that clinician support. So we developed an online program specifically targeting rumination and worry, and we evaluated its efficacy in reducing RNT and symptoms of depression and anxiety and compared this to a treatment uh, treatment as usual control group. Our second aim then was to compare treatment effects and program adherence when the intervention was delivered with and without clinician guidance. So we used a randomised control trial design and we recruited participants across Australia via social media who then applied online via our virtual clinic website. 
And to be eligible, participants needed to be an Australian resident over the age of 18 with access to a computer and internet who were experiencing elevated levels of RNT. And applicants were excluded if they reported subthreshold levels of RNT and were referred to more appropriate services if they reported severe depression symptoms or current suicidality. Um, eligible participants from that online application were then contacted for a brief phone call with a clinician, and this included a structured diagnostic interview using the ADIS-5 to assess for um, current MDD and GAD and also included a risk assessment. So participants were then randomly allocated to one of the three treatment groups, the clinician guided group who received a phone call from a clinician after completing each lesson. And during these calls, clinicians checked in on how participants were going with the program, um, answered any questions they had about the treatment content and helped troubleshoot any difficulties they were having practicing the treatment skills. The second group was the self-help group who completed the program in an unguided format and didn't receive any additional clinician coaching or support. And then the third group there is the control group and they received access to the intervention in a self-help format after an 18 week waiting period. And for participants in that self-help or control group, the um, contact with a clinician or research staff was only in response to participant request or if there was a significant deterioration in their questionnaire scores. So participants who were randomly allocated to either that clinician guided or self-help group received immediate access to the online program. And the program consists of three online comic style lessons or modules completed over a six week period. And it follows two fictional characters who frequently worry and ruminate and then learn how to better manage this using the skills taught in the program. So treatment content and skills were drawn from a number of CBT based treatments for RNT, such as rumination focused CBT and mindfulness based cognitive therapy. And it included components such as psychoeducation, three rules of thumb to help differentiate between helpful and unhelpful rumination and worry, um, attention shifting and structured problem solving. And participants were explicitly advised that each treatment strategy could be applied to both ruminating and worrying. So each of the three lessons consists of lesson slides and these follow the character stories, introduce the treatment skills and examples of how to apply these in daily life. And then following each lesson, participants download a one page lesson summary and action plan. And this has an overview of the topics and skills in the lesson and also some practice activities to help them reinforce the treatment skills. And they also had access to a range of extra resources. And to help us evaluate the program, participants completed a number of self-report measures at baseline, one week post-treatment and three month follow-up. And we used a trans-diagnostic measure of RNT, the RTQ-10, um, because it's independent of disorder-specific content, in addition to more commonly utilised measures of rumination and worry, like the Penn State Worry Questionnaire. And we also looked at um, the number of lessons participants completed and their satisfaction ratings. So in total, we had 137 participants aged between 18 and 74 included in the trial, the majority of whom were female, born in Australia, well-educated and employed in either full-time or part-time work. And at baseline, their mean scores on the self-report measures of anxiety and depression were in the moderate range. Um, during the structured diagnostic interviews, almost 70% of the sample met diagnostic criteria for generalised anxiety disorder, while 30% met criteria for MDD. Um, and 29% of participants reported current psychotherapy treatment and 42% reported current medication for either depression and or anxiety. So before I present the outcome data, I did just want to highlight that we've only just finished collecting the data. So the last participant finished up on Monday this week. So today I'll just be presenting our initial analyses. But using linear mixed models, we found statistically significant improvements in participants' levels of RNT, rumination and worry between pre and post treatment in both the clinician guided and self-help groups. And this was then maintained at three month follow up. 
comparing between the groups then, the clinician guided and self-help groups were significantly lower than the control group on each of these measures at both post and three month follow-up. And we also found significant differences between the clinician guided and self-help group. So the clinician guided group showed significantly greater improvements across all measures compared to the self-help group at both post and three month follow-up. We also found significant improvements for symptoms of depression and anxiety in both the clinician guided and self-help groups, suggesting transdiagnostic benefit. So by post-treatment, the mean scores on our self-report measures of anxiety and depression were below the clinical cutoff for probable diagnosis, diagnoses of GAD and MDD in both the clinician guided and self-help groups. And this was maintained at three month follow-up. And then comparing between the groups, symptoms of anxiety and depression were significantly lower in the treatment groups compared to control at both post and three month follow up. And again, we saw a bigger improvement in the clinician guided group compared to the self help group at both post and three month follow up. But um, of no, the clinician guided group was significantly lower than the control group on a number of these measures at baseline. So I do need to run um, some further analyses and look at controlling for those baseline differences. In terms of adherence and engagement of the participants who started less than one, 76% in the clinician guided group and 79% in the self-help group completed all three lessons of the program. And the rate of program completion and average time spent reading the lesson materials or practicing the skills taught in the program didn't differ significantly between the two groups. The mean satisfaction ratings also didn't differ significantly between the two treatment groups, but participants in the clinician guided group were significantly more confident that the program had taught them skills um, to better manage their rumination and worry compared to the self-help group. And in terms of the qualitative feedback we received, so participants in both of those treatment groups reported that the program was easy to understand, and the skills were practical and relatively easy to implement. Um, participants in the clinician guided group also reported that the check-in calls helped to normalise their difficulties with rumination and worry, helped them to stay motivated throughout the program and also problem solve any difficulties they were having practising the treatment skills. And then in terms of dislikes, um, participants reported disliking more of the technical aspects of the program. So things like the slides weren't mobile friendly, they had to be accessed on a laptop or computer, or that it wasn't delivered as an app. And some of the participants in the self-help group also expressed that the lack of interaction with the research team made it a lot, made it harder to stay motivated and engaged and that they would have preferred to be able to speak to someone about the lesson content and how to implement the skills. So again, do need to acknowledge that this is brand new data and I've just presented our initial analyses today. But in general, our findings replicate those of the previous studies by Topper and Cook and add to the growing research base suggesting internet delivered interventions can explicitly target and reduce both rumination and worry and that doing so has transdiagnostic benefit. And the results also extend upon this existing literature by demonstrating this in an adult population, including those is currently experiencing uh, clinically significant levels of depression and anxiety. And as I mentioned earlier, those um, more recently developed self-guided online programs that include the features designed to increase engagement, they've shown similar rates of adherence and improvement to clinician guided groups. So we had hypothesized that we'd see quite similar results between the clinician guided and self-help group. Interestingly, despite engagement and satisfaction being high in both groups, treatment outcomes were significantly better in the clinician guided group. So at this point, we're still not 100% sure why this is the case and need to do a little bit more digging in the data and some further analyses and come up with some hypotheses about this. But I guess of note, we are still seeing significant improvements in that um, self-help group, and this is maintained at follow-up. So it does suggest that the intervention can successfully be delivered in a self-help format. And just before I finish up today, just want to touch on some of the limitations of the study. So as I mentioned, most of the participants were female, well-educated and self-referred, so therefore sort of self-motivated to complete an internet-delivered program, um, which might 
limit the generalizability of our findings. Participants also weren't blind to their treatment condition, so we can't rule out things like expectancy effects or response bias. Then in terms of future directions, like I said, need to conduct some more detailed analyses, um, come up with some hypotheses about the different groups, also hoping to evaluate the program outside of sort of a tightly controlled research setting um, and do it in a real world setting with the general public and see about its effectiveness. So I might leave it there for today and I'll stop sharing my screen. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Amy. That was such a good Welcome. quality talk. Really impressive. So please join me. If everyone unmutes to give Amy a round of applause. Okay. Now, the other thing I have to say is, as part of this conference, we had a process where we asked students to submit uh, their abstracts and we um, have a student prize. Now, the student award for this conference is awarded to Amy. And uh, we judged the uh, submissions on the basis of the scope of the research, the quality, and also things like the potential impact. And I have to say, Amy, I was most definitely not disappointed. It was a wonderful presentation and a very, you. Um, you know, really good piece of work. So again, can we give Amy another round of, of applause uh, for the award, student award? Thank you, really appreciate it. Thank you for listening, everyone. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to ask our next speaker, who's David Priest, to try sharing the slides. Is that okay, David? Warren, if you yep. can assign co-host. Uh, and David is from Curtin University and the University of Western Australia. And uh, I won't say any more. Over to you. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for introducing me. Can everyone hear me and see slides okay? Yeah, so I was just wanting to talk today about some of the work uh, we're doing on alexithymia, which is basically a, a trait or a construct where people have a lot of difficulty processing and describing their emotions. And it's been quite well established as an important transdiagnostic risk factor for a variety of psychopathologies. But one of the real remaining questions is like or why that is, like what are the core mechanisms that link high levels of alexithymia to specific psychopathologies? And so I was wanting to talk today about a recent study we've done uh, looking at effective disorder symptoms and using that in a broad sense of depression, anxiety symptoms, and whether it is uh, the impact that alexithymia has on emotion regulation skills that is the core pathway or one of the core pathways through which alexithymia ends up being related to effective disorder symptoms. So before I go into that, though, I just... Uh, in terms of the structure, I was wanting to give a bit of background first, just on, I guess, the history or definition of alexithymia and also some of the theoretical conceptual work our group's been doing in this space over the past couple of years that's informed, I guess, the hypothesis of that pathway from alexithymia to emotion regulation difficulties being quite core. So I'm just going to spend the first part of the presentation talking about some of that background and that theoretical framework and then going into our specific mediation study where we really looked at, tried to look at statistically, is that link between alexithymia and affective disorder symptoms explained by that impairing effect of alexithymia on emotion regulation difficulties. So just in terms of some background about alexithymia, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, but some people might not have. So it's a, it's a trait that was coined in the 1970s by a group of American psychiatrists, uh, Sipnios and Namaya where they were working a lot with people that had psychosomatic disorders. So disorders where there was physical or medical symptoms, but they couldn't find a physical or medical cause. So they assumed there was some psychological component. And they observed that in a lot of their patients, they had a, a profound difficulties processing and talking about their emotional states. And so they termed this, coined this term alexithymia to describe that trait, uh, that, that set of, emotion processing deficits. And so there's quite good evidence now that it's a multi-dimensional trait with three interrelated components. So one's degree of alexithymia is one's degree of difficulty identifying your own feelings, difficulties describing those feelings, and also an externally orientated thinking style where you tend to want to focus your attention 
externally on the external world rather than on your internal emotional states. So for someone with high levels of alexithymia, they will tend to not focus attention on their internal emotional states, on their emotions. And when they are focusing attention, have a lot of difficulty differentiating and understanding and identifying and describing those emotional states. And so as I touched on before, it's been quite well established as linked to a variety of different psychopathologies and particularly psychopathologies that have a core emotion, emotion dysregulation, disordered levels of emotion type component. So things like depression, anxiety disorder, borderline personality disorder, substance use disorders. But one of the core questions remaining uh, that hasn't looked at as much in the context of emotion regulation is why is that? Like, what are the mechanisms that mean that alexithymia is associated with these uh, high risk of these psychopathologies? And so the work our group's been doing, a lot of it has been housing alexithymia within emotion regulation frameworks. And so one of the hypotheses we had was that, well, in terms of alexithymia linking to increased depression or anxiety symptoms, maybe a core explanation is alexithymia impairing emotion regulation abilities, which in turn means people can't up or down regulate their emotions as effectively and are more predisposed to things like depression, anxiety disorders, where there's disordered levels of emotion. So some of the rationale behind that, well, most of the rationale behind that comes from uh, our, our conceptual work that we, we started doing, uh, well, I started doing in 2017, uh, but it was based in uh, James Gross's emotion regulation model, the process uh, model of emotion regulation, which is one of the really prominent emotion regulation models I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, but what I did in, during my PhD was basically try to map alexithymia within that particular model, which is like a cognitive model of emotion regulation. So I thought I'd just give a brief rundown of that to establish some of the rationale for the study. So, uh, and the alexithymia model that I, that are created from that was we call it the attention appraisal model of alexithymia. So what James's model basically says is that people uh, generate, process, and regulate their emotions through these things called valuation systems, which are a four-stage sequence, situation, attention, appraisal, response, through which people evaluate stimuli in terms of what they mean for their goals. So what we've got on the left there is a valuation system where someone is generating an emotion. So on the left there, um, the situation stage in that sort of valuation system would be the presence of an emotion inducing stimulus. So it might be a snake comes into the room. At the attention stage, that AT1 there, I focus attention on the stimulus, I notice the snake. At the appraisal stage, I appraise that stimulus in terms of what it is and what it means for my goals. Hey, this is a snake, this is bad for my goal of staying alive. And based on that appraisal, at the response stage, that final stage, I might have an emotion come up in me, say the emotion of fear. And then what James and my model says is that we then process and regulate that emotion through a second valuation system where that emotion that was just generated becomes the target of evaluation. So it's the, the situation stage in that second evaluation system on the right there. That's now that emotion of fear that was just generated. In order to process and regulate that, we need to focus attention on it at the attention stage notice that emotion at the appraisal stage, then appraise what is this emotion and what does it mean for my goals? And based on that appraisal, at the response stage, we might then activate a goal to try to regulate that emotion, try to modify the trajectory of it. So within James's process model, that final stage there, that's where emotion regulation is happening, where we're deciding what do we want to do about this emotion and what sort of strategies might fit? How long should I do them for? How's it going? Should, should I stop, switch? what I'm doing. Uh, and so as part of my PhD work, I basically mapped and said, hey, I think alexithymia is one's degree of difficulty at the attention appraisal stages of that second valuation system. So when we're processing through an emotion uh, at that attention stage, our degree of difficulty there, focusing attention on emotion, that represents our externally orientated thinking, and our degree of difficulty at the appraisal stage that represent, that's represented by the different identifying and describing feelings. Uh, and so someone with high alexithymia, it's not necessarily that they don't experience emotion. And quite to the contrary, what we find is, at least in terms of negative emotions, people with high alexithymia will tend to report much more intense 
or more frequent experiences of negative emotion. But it's more about the structure, at least within my model, the structure of the affect. So experiencing those emotions in a very undifferentiated, unstructured way, like I'm just feeling bad or good, being able to drill down to am I sad, scared or angry, having a lot more difficulty in that. And so I guess within this model, those emotion regulation decisions centrally hinge on the appraisal of the emotion. Because it might be that there's certain emotion regulation strategies that work really well when we're sad, but not as well when we're sad or angry. So we've got high lexithymia and we have a lot of difficulty being confident on those differentiations. We're at a much more disadvantage in then making good decisions about how to go on and when to go on and regulate those emotions. So the model, I guess, really pitches that appraisal as being really important. And that, by definition, is where alexithymia is impairing things. And so what we expect to see and what we do see in the literature is people with high levels of lexithymia tend to report much more emotion regulation difficulties. And so when we're thinking about psychopathologies that are characterized by disordered levels of emotion and maybe people needing to be able to downregulate or upregulate those emotional states, someone with high lexithymia is more disadvantaged in terms of having that good foundation to facilitate being effective in doing that. And so that's sort of some of the conceptual rationale behind why we started moving into this space of, oh, is alexithymia associated with certain psychopathologies because it's impairing emotion regulation? Uh, so our research question in this particular mediation study that I'll present on today was, is that link between alexithymia and affective disorder symptoms in terms of depression, anxiety symptoms, explained by the impairing effect of alexithymia on emotion regulation. So mapping out a mediation model where we're looking at those direct pathways between alexithymia and affective disorder symptoms, but that indirect pathway through emotion regulation difficulties as well. So in terms of our method, uh, for this particular study, we had 501 general community adults from the United States of America, and they were corrected, collected by a survey, online survey company, Cortrix Panel, to be broadly representative of the adult United States population in terms of gender, age, and location. And they completed a big battery of self-report measures that included measures of alexithymia, emotion regulation ability, and uh, effective disorder symptoms. So we had the Perth alexithymia questionnaire, which is a measure um, our group developed, 24 item measure of alexithymia across negative and positive emotions. We also had the Perth Emotion Regulation Competency Imagery, or the PERSI, which again is a measure our group developed as a 32 item measure of how much difficulty people have regulating their negative and positive emotions. And from the, the pack in the PERSI, you can get out various subscale scores across you know, processing and regulating negative emotions in different aspects and positive emotions in different aspects. But you can also just generate total scale scores that are like overall markers of like I mean, overall markers of emotion regulation ability. And so that's what we used in this particular study. And for effective disorder symptoms, we used the depression, anxiety, stress scale. And uh, for the main analysis, we used the total scale score from that sort of composite of depression, anxiety, stress, which has quite a good psychometric foundation behind using that as this overall marker of internalizing type symptoms. Uh, our main analysis was a mediation analysis using process, the process package in SPSS, and we were really interested in those direct and indirect effects between alexithymia and emotion regulation and affective disorder symptoms. We did control for key demographic variables in that particular analysis as well. So in terms of our results, uh, just like starting with basic PIS and correlation stuff, what, what we see is alexithymia was quite strongly correlated with more emotion regulation difficulties and effective disorder symptoms. And also emotion regulation difficulties were uh, strongly correlated with effective disorder symptoms, which is typical of what we routinely see uh, in the literature. But I guess the more novel aspect was the mapping of direct and indirect effects. And just to sort of, I guess, clarify, this is done at one time point. This isn't longitudinal. Uh, so there is that limitation of it. So we're just, yeah cross-sectional data. But what we see here is that the direct relationship between alexithymia and affective disorder symptoms disappears. If you look at that bottom line, is no longer significant once you account for that pathway through emotion regulation. So that pathway at the top there is significant where we see high levels of alexithymia significantly associated with more difficulties overall regulating emotions, which is in turn linked to 
uh, more, uh, more severe levels of affective disorder symptoms. And so our overall model there with uh, collective diameter and emotion regulation was accounting for about half the variance in, in DAS scores. And so that's very much, I guess, in line with this hypothesis that that pathway through emotion regulation seems a really core uh, thing to consider. And so in terms of some of our thinking about explaining or, or thinking about implications, I guess one of the main ones was it being consistent with that view that alexithymia might be linked as a core pathway or a core mechanism to effective disorder symptoms via that impairing effect of alexithymia on emotion regulation. And theoretically, in terms of theoretical contributions, we think that might help to clarify some of these core mechanisms by which alexithymia is operating as a transdiagnostic risk factor. And then clinically, uh, kind of emphasizing the need or the utility maybe of considering those interacting roles of alexithymia and emotion regulation in our case conceptualization of the treatment plan. And so, I mean, one potential uh, like interpretation of this might be, oh, you know, well, maybe emotion regulation is just the main thing there. And maybe I don't need to worry too much about it. But I don't have that particular interpretation. My interpretation, I guess, within our theoretical framework is very much in line with this idea of like high alexithymia being problematic and like emotional awareness being a core foundational core foundation for effective emotion regulation. So very much considering both in working with someone and trying to improve treatment outcomes of needing to consider and provide that effective foundation for good emotion regulation through addressing Alexa timer as well. So assessing and, and ideally trying to treat both if relevant for that particular client. Some future directions that we're quite interested in now are uh, doing longitudinal design. So as I mentioned, this is cross-sectional, which is a limitation in terms of being able to confidently talk about causality or directionality or things like that. So longitudinally tracking alexithymia, emotion regulation, and effective disorder symptom levels to get a bit more confident on how things map out over time. Also looking at other symptom categories, obviously we're just looking at depression and anxiety here. And by the way, if you do that modeling with depression and anxiety separately, the same pattern comes out, uh, but we're also interested in doing it in some other symptom clusters that I guess are defined or characterized by emotion dysregulation. So things like eating disorder symptoms or borderline personality disorder symptoms. We have a student in our lab right now uh, doing this sort of modeling with eating disorder symptoms and finding similar findings. So that's an avenue that we're quite excited to keep exploring. And also keeping in mind as well, this is a general community sample. So doing this in some clinical samples and, and seeing the extent to which these same patterns might, might replicate out. So those are some of the uh, directions we're interested in going forward in continuing to explore alexithymia and emotion regulation as the, these transdiagnostic factors operating together. I think I might stop there and, and just allow some time for questions if there are any, but yeah, if you, if you want to collaborate on some stuff or email and have a chat, my email's up there, my Twitter's up there. And also uh, if things like the Perth alexithymia questionnaire the, the Percy, those sort of measures, you like them, they're freely available online. So you can get them on my research gate or on our lab website. So yeah, any questions? Th thank you very much for inviting me to present, well, allowing me to present and, and for listening. Thank you very much, David. That was another fascinating talk. So round of applause. Um, so questions. Feel free to unmute or you can use the chat, whichever. No, I, I, no questions so far, David. I think you've, uh, you know, it was such a thorough talk. Um, really, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Another moment for any questions? Just, sorry, I'm just trying to check the uh, chat as well, so I'm sort of multitasking here slightly. <laughs> and if anything comes up later, feel free to email me. Oh, no, that Warren's got a question. Yep. I, I could. Um, brilliant talk, David. Really thorough. Um, yeah. I'm aware that there's quite a. Um, a wider cultural understanding of alexithymia as well as some kind of niches of 
of psychology and psychotherapy that use the term alexithymia. Have you shared mm. your emergent findings with those groups who might, you might argue have some investment in the, in the kind of construct itself rather than it being deconstructed into emotion regulation? Yeah, yeah. So there's, uh, I guess that's something I didn't go into is there is some ongoing debate in the literature about what alexithymia is and how broadly it should be defined. So some of the uh, early models and still very popular models uh, and very influential models are based more in psychoanalytic theories, whereas I guess mine's more from like a cognitive behavioral theory type perspective. And so that they'll use a broader definition of alexithymia that also includes as a core component difficulties fantasizing. Um, and so I guess in us introducing our model, part of the rationale for that was not only to link it to emotion regulation, but help to try to establish. So there's most findings in the alexithymia literature, whilst difficulty fantasizing was quite core to early definitions of alexithymia, psychometrically when people go to measure it, difficulty fantasizing doesn't tend to cohere with those other components of alexithymia. So part of introducing my model is basically trying to explain that in saying that if you're identifying feelings, describe feelings and externalizing thinking, at least in my thinking, seem very connected in that they're all core to that emotion processing experience and core to your experience of emotions, whereas different use fantasizing is maybe more broad and doesn't necessarily need to be fantasizing about emotions. It can be fantasizing about a range of things. So in our model, we talk about what are the causes of alexithymia? Basically, those cognitive emotion schema systems uh, that people use to process emotions, that sort of underlying your degree of different identifying feelings, describing feelings, and externalizing thinking, and also the degree to which you're avoiding focusing on emotions. So it's all very focused on emotions, which makes it a bit more of a narrow construct. But uh, one thing to consider as well with that is um, most of the literature has measured it to date with the Toronto Alexithymia scale, the TAS-20, uh, which actually only includes those three components. It doesn't include the fantasizing aspect because psychometrically it didn't go here, so it was removed. So most of the Alexithymia literature that we have to date that are looking at connections with psychopathology are actually using that three component definition. Um, in terms of my model, I don't necessarily consider it like a merger with the emotion regulation construct. Uh, I do very much see them as separate. So alexithymia being separable from emotion regulation. But I guess what we were trying to do was map it within that sort of emotion regulation framework to, I guess, uh, try to make uh, added clarity around how alexithymia might interact with different aspects of emotion regulation as part of this package that's relevant to transdiagnostic work. Thanks, David. Yes, thank you very much for clarifying all of that. Um, we have come to the end of our first session and uh, we now have a 10 minute break. So we will be starting with our next keynote uh, at quarter past eight, which is UK time, of course. Uh, and it's a little difficult to do all of the different time zone translations. So let's just take a 10 minute break, shall we? And uh, we'll see you very soon. Thank you.